Paramansa Yogananda, founder of the Self-Realization Fellowship in Los Angeles in 1925, was the first great master of India to live and teach in the West. During the 30 years he spent in Southern California, he dedicated himself to explaining and expanding on the teachings of the Old and New Testament. In his inspiring book, The Autobiography of a Yogi, he tells of his spiritual training in India and of his master's close connection with the teachings of Jesus. Yogananda's direct disciple, Swami Kriyananda, an American and founder of the Ananda Cooperative Village and Meditation Retreat in Northern California, recalls what Yogananda had to say about the lost years of Jesus. Yes, Yogananda often talked about the missing years of Jesus and the fact that he spent them in India, or a large part of them. He told us once that the three wise men had come to the manger from India and that Jesus' visit to India was to return their visit. In his book, Man's Eternal Quest, which is a book of his sermons that was published by Self-Realization Fellowship, he says, God made Jesus Christ an Oriental in order to bring East and West together. Christ came to awaken the divine consciousness of brotherhood in the East and West. It is true that Christ lived in India during most of the 18 unaccounted for years of his life, studying with India's great masters. That doesn't take away from his divinity and uniqueness. It shows the unity and brotherhood of all great saints and avatars. Yoganandaji was talking not from a level of scholarship, but of intuition. And when he saw the life of Jesus in India, it was from that level that he was talking. Although he also mentioned that there were re records in India, such as Notovich's, but he had seen it himself and spoke with certainty. Is it possible that there were once records detailing the missing years in the life of Jesus? If so, what could have happened to those records? To explore the question further, let's travel back in time to 325 AD, the year Emperor Constantine brought together more than 300 bishops from the farthest boundaries of the Roman Empire for the first ecumenical council at Nicaea. Constantine's purpose was to create a union between church and state. At the council, deletions and additions to the church doctrine were agreed upon. It was here that Jesus was designated as the Son of God, that is, the essence of the Father, who was begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father. This was adopted as the Nicene Creed. Having proclaimed Jesus as the only begotten Son of God, Constantine now found the historical Jesus contradicted his newly established Nicene Creed. In 389 AD, just 64 years after the first ecumenical council, it is said that the church put to fire the vast depository of ancient knowledge of the Alexandria Library, manuscripts that might have contradicted Constantine's Nicene Creed. Subsequent ecumenical councils further altered the original doctrine. It is therefore possible that somewhere during the evolution of the church, the history of Jesus from age 12 to 30 may very well have been deleted from church doctrine in an excess of zeal. In fact, one gets the impression that other things were taken out of the Bible too. You know, the early Christians used to believe in reincarnation. The Jews believe in it. The Orthodox Jews still believe in it. And, uh, Origen, one of the greatest theologians, second to St. Augustine even, uh, so great was he, said that he got the teaching of reincarnation from apostolic times. This teaching wasn't taken out of the Christian doctrine until 553 at the Second Council of Constantinople, uh, 553 AD. They found recently that Pope Vigilius, who was present in Constantinople, boycotted that council, didn't go to it. I think there was only one prelate from Rome. They anathematized Origen for political reasons and at the same time took out all his teachings, including that of reincarnation. But we do find little glimpses and hints in the Bible about reincarnation, uh, about Elijah, for example, coming before the Messiah, Jesus saying that John the Baptist was Elias or Elijah. Uh, many other passages are indicative of uh, this teaching being accepted. Um, for example, when Jesus said, Whom do men say that I am? The disciples say, Some say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. 
Jesus didn't correct them for saying that uh, people were saying that he was an incarnation, which is obviously what was meant, of one of the ancient prophets. So we get the impression that the Bible was tampered with for the usual reasons, which is institutional religion. When they try to institutionalize religion, they also bring out the more convenient things that will support their church dogmas. And this is what I think they must have done, and what Yogananda indicated that they did do with the Bible, that there were many high and deep teachings there that are not available except through the lives of great saints who lived those teachings and realized them in their own lives. Where is it that the gurus and enlightened ones get their knowledge? The knowledge they seem to glean from somewhere beyond time and space. Is it the Akashic record? That which saints and psychics the world over refer to as a continuous record of all mankind's earthly experience. A kind of cosmic computer which only a privileged few have been able to tune into. These imperishable records are said to reside in a sort of universal mind existing somewhere beyond time and space. The American-born Edgar Cayce, world-renowned prophet and psychic of the 20th century, demonstrated his ability to read the Akashic Record in over 14,500 clairvoyant readings. Casey baffled doubters, astounded believers, and was almost always proved correct. Time after time, in his self-induced sleep state, references to Jesus of Nazareth would appear until a clear picture of the lost years emerged. Documented in Edgar Casey's story of Jesus, the following information was revealed about Jesus' education. In a trance state, Casey said, the periods of study in Palestine were only at the time of his sojourn in the temple, or in Jerusalem during those periods when he was quoted by Luke as being among the rabbi or teachers. His studies in India, Persia, and Egypt covered much greater periods that there might be completed the more perfect knowledge of the material related to those cleansings of the body in preparation for strength of the physical, as well as in the mental man. In India today, it is possible to observe these practices. Cleansing is not only a physical act, but a purification of the thoughts, words, and actions of the individual. The goal is oneness, the merging of the purified individual with God. It is salvation, Union Yoga. Cleansing of thought is attained by focusing the attention on a chosen aspect of God. When, through this practice of concentration, the individual transcends the sense of self and merges with the object of attention, it becomes meditation. The continued practice of meditation and prayer frees the mind of external influences and desires and allows it to perceive its divine inner nature. Cleansing the mind permits the body to function free of stress and dis-ease. The body can then manifest its energy in the form of strength, endurance, and abilities we term miraculous. The creative energy of life is perceived as residing within each individual, coiled as a serpent at the base of the spine from where it will rise and travel along a path, activating seven centers of energy called chakras. These centers are Survival, reproduction, power, universal love, creativity, awareness, self-realization. There is one law at the base of this philosophy. We recognize it as Newton's law of physics, which says, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. In the East, this is called the law of karma and is the foundation of religious as well as scientific thought. Is it possible that Western science, the golden rule of Christianity, and the first law of Eastern philosophy are presenting the same message? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, because for each action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Dr. Jack Hislop, president of the Satya Sai Baba Society of America, translates what Sai Baba had to say on one occasion about Jesus Christ. I was a Wiswani when a question was asked about the early life of Jesus. 
because there were, had been so many rumors that Jesus spent some time in India as a young man. And Swami replied, yes, that Jesus did spend time in India, that he arrived in India at about the age 16. He traveled through India and parts of Tibet and parts of what is now Persia, that sometimes he wore a sort of a dhoti garment, a wrap, that uh, sometimes people took him for just a traveling yogi. Because of serious hardships when he was uh, very young, he acquired the habit of having only one meal a day throughout his life. That was his custom. And then Swami said that at about age 25, Jesus realized that uh, he was Christ. At another time, Casey was asked, what is the significance and meaning of the words Jesus and Christ? He replied, Jesus is the man, the activity, the mind, the relationships he bore to others. He was loving. He was kind. He was gentle. He grew faint. He grew weak, and yet gained the strength which he had promised in becoming the Christ by fulfilling and overcoming the world. Ye are made strong in body, in mind, in soul and purpose, by that power in Christ. The power, then, is in the Christ. The pattern is in Jesus. Two thousand years ago, the world was at a low spiritual ebb. The days of the biblical prophets were past. Then, one man, Jesus of Nazareth, in three short years, changed the course of history forever. The legend begins with the birth of Saint Isa. And now the time had come which the Supreme Judge, in his boundless clemency, had chosen to incarnate himself in a human being. Soon after, a wonderful child was born in the land of Israel. God himself, through the mouth of this child, spoke of the nothingness of the body and the grandeur of the soul. The parents of this newborn child were poor people, belonging by birth to a family distinguished by their piety. To reward them, God blessed the firstborn of this family he chose him as his elect and sent him forth to raise those that had fallen into evil and to heal them that suffered. The divine child, to whom was given the name of Isa, commenced even in his most tender years to speak of the one and indivisible God, exhorting the people that had strayed from the path of righteousness to repent and purify themselves of the sins that they had committed. The people came from near and far to listen and marvel at the words of wisdom that fell from this infant's lips. All the Israelites united in proclaiming that the eternal spirit dwelt within this child. The biblical account of the life and teachings of Jesus covers the periods in his life from birth to age 12 and from age 30 to his crucifixion. This leaves 18 years, the major part of his life, unaccounted for. Dr. John C. Trevor is the director of the Dead Sea Scrolls Project, School of Theology at Claremont, California. Dr. Trevor, author and biblical scholar, examines the Christian position regarding the years not revealed in the Gospels. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, more than any other discovery in recent decades, has enabled us literally to walk into biblical history and especially at that crucial time in biblical history that saw the end of the Old Testament period and the beginning of the New Testament. The story of the Dead Sea Scrolls spans the entire lifetime of Jesus, yet not a single fragment or a reference either to Jesus or to the early Christian church is found in the manuscripts. And nevertheless, the discovery has shed a flood of light upon the background of that very period of the early life of Jesus. Now, the orthodox position of the early Christian church 
has been through the centuries that which is based upon the four Gospels, those Gospels which have the only records of the early life of Jesus, which are very fragmentary. And as a result, since those are the only canonized or authentic, considered authentic records, therefore the attitude of the church has been based upon them. And thus, Jesus is seen to be in Nazareth in a carpenter family's home during all those years, with the slight exception of the story in the Gospel of Luke. And so it is that as far as the traditions are concerned of the modern times, they are based only on a very few fragments. But one thing is historically clear, without any question of a doubt, that the early Christian church developed as a result of the emphasis upon the death, resurrection, and the teachings of Jesus. And that is the extent of our knowledge historically, that we might say. Now, speculations, of course, have been going on about the early life of Jesus and have put Jesus in many parts of the world, even including India. Our search for the missing years of Jesus takes us to India, land of spiritual receptivity, the birthplace of Rama, Krishna, and Buddha. India, a land of contrast and mystery, with a spiritual heritage that dates back before the dawn of recorded history. A country where 600 million people are struggling to enter the 20th century. From the delicate beauty of the Taj Mahal to the harsh realities of the streets of Calcutta, India overwhelms the senses. Spiritual teachings of India's numerous religions echo past glories of her golden age. A highly advanced civilization that flourished over 5,000 years ago when the Vedas and Upanishads, mankind's oldest scriptures, came into being. Introducing the science of yoga, the path to God realization. Here in this land of spiritual receptivity, the birthplace of Rama, Krishna and Buddha. The lives of saints and holy men are revered and preserved in ancient texts and documents. In the archives of an ancient Tibetan monastery, there are said to be records originally written in India in the ancient Pali language and later translated into Tibetan dealing with the life of an extraordinary saint known to the Buddhists as Isa. The life story of Saint Isa closely resembles the life of Jesus Christ, revealing what may well be the lost years of Jesus. Our search for the legend of Saint Isa takes us to Srinagar, in the Kashmir Valley of India. It is here, north of Srinagar, in a remote ancient monastery, that scrolls telling of the life and death of Saint Isa were found. Northeast, along the Trans-Himalayan range in the India-China border of what was once Tibet, we find Leh, the capital of Ladakh. This ancient city lies in the Indus River Valley, high in the Kashmir region of India. Very few Westerners have ever visited this remote city, dotted with monasteries and castles of ancient kings. This road, approaching Leh, is paralleled by long prayer walls, each of these stones bearing a Buddhist prayer. Twenty miles beyond Leh is Himis, one of the principal Buddhist monasteries of the country. It was here, in 1887, that a Russian traveler named Nicholas Notovich came after hearing stories of ancient writings about a man the Buddhists call Saint Isa. Notovich approached the head lama at the Himis Monastery with a request to see the writings and was politely refused with the statement that perhaps he could see them on his next visit. Since getting there once had been an extremely arduous task, 
he had his doubts about returning. Shortly after departing, his donkey fell and Notovich broke his leg. He asked to be taken back to him as to convalesce, and during his second visit, the Lama relented. Notovich had a member of his party translate the scrolls as he wrote down the verses. It is said that the scrolls are accurate records of the stories carried to the east by merchant caravans, and that the legend was written shortly after the caravans brought word of the crucifixion of Saint Isa. The manuscripts read to Notovich by the Lama of the Himis Monastery were collections of different copies written in the Tibetan language. They were translations of the original scrolls written in ancient Pali. The originals, Notovich learned, were in the library of Lhasa in Tibet, where the Dalai Lama resided. In 1925, the late Swami Abedananda, a direct disciple of Ramakrishna Paramahansa and founder of the Ramakrishna Vedanta Mat in Calcutta, wrote a book about his travels in which he told of going to Himis and seeing the same manuscript Notovich saw. He had been skeptical of Notovich's claim and was determined to find the scrolls or expose the fraud. His book entitled Kashmiri o Tibeti includes a translation of 14 chapters, a total of 224 stanzas relating to the life of Saint Isa. Stanzas strikingly similar to the Notovich version. Dharmawara, president of the Buddhist Center in New Delhi and founder of the Ashoka Mission, a monastic order, visited Himas Kompa at Leh Ladakh. There he was shown documents referring to the life of Saint Isa, both in the original Pali language and in the Tibetan translation. Um, well, you see, I had known about the visit of Jesus to India and uh, Tibet long before I visited uh, Hemis Gumpa in uh, Western Tibet, that is to say in Ladakh. Now when I went there, well, I made some investigation about the fact of uh, the visit and I had been shown the record which was uh, written on uh, old traditional uh, paper made of uh, birch uh, bark. Uh, it was uh, in Pali and the translation in Tibetan as well. And it is said that he had uh, mastered the teaching of the Buddha as well as a greater part of Hinduism. It was by chance that I got interested in the subject. I happened to be the director of archives, archaeology and research and museum in the state and I would go to Ladakh often. We got stuck up there and we had no work so we were in search of books. So I went to the Marian Mission Library to search out some books so that we could read. I became friendly with the caretaker of that Moran mission. His name was Reverend Chatan Punsu. He told me that he has a very interesting reference about Saint Isa. I said, what do you mean by Saint Isa? And he told me about Isa, what you say, Hazrat Isa, one of the prophets. The name of Nicholas Nauti was, was there and it came to light that he had come to Ladakh. He had stayed at this uh, Hemas Gumpa. Nicholas Notovich stayed in this monastery for some days. During his stay, he befriended a Lama. The Lama shared some astonishing things with him. He showed him ancient scrolls which mentioned the story of Jesus in India. There are hundreds and thousands of ancient manuscripts in these archives. They contain discourses of the teachings of Buddha and great Buddhist monks of yore. 
Many of these manuscripts have come from other Tibetan monasteries and ancient universities like Nalanda of Magadha. Ancient India had several great universities, learning centers and libraries like Nalanda, Vikramshila, Takshashila and Udantpuri. When the Mughals invaded India, they destroyed most of these universities. When the attacks were taking place, many Buddhist monks escaped to Tibet carrying loads of manuscripts and books with them. The Hemis manuscript which Notovich saw was perhaps one of such documents. The Hemis manuscripts tell us that around the age of 13, boy Jesus left his home and traveled to the east. When Isa had attained the age of 13, when an Israelite should take a wife, the house in which his parents dwelt and earned their livelihood in modest labor became a meeting place for the rich and noble who desired to gain for a son-in-law the young Isa, already celebrated for his edifying discourses in the name of the Almighty. It was then that Isa disappeared secretly from his father's house, left Jerusalem, and with a caravan of merchants went toward Send with the purpose of perfecting himself in the divine knowledge and studying the laws of the great Buddhas. He traveled through the famous Silk Route, which links Europe and Asia. Then he arrived in India. According to the legend, Isa traveled overland and by sea, arriving in an area called the Sin, which is located in the Indus River Valley region of North India. He was 14 when he crossed the Sindh, going south to Palipana in Gujarat, where he studied with the Jains in their temples. He traveled to Jagannath in Orissa to study the Vedas and Upanishads with the Brahmin priests. He spent six years in North India studying the scriptures in the holy cities of Jagannath and Benares, and then journeyed north to the Himalayas, to the country of the Gautamides, the followers of the Buddha, mastering the teachings of Buddha. In the course of his 14th year, the young Isa, blessed of God, crossed the Sindh and established himself among the Aryas in the cherished country of God. The fame of this wonderful youth Isa spread throughout northern Sindh. When Isa crossed the country of the Five Rivers and Rajputana, the worshippers of the Jain sect implored him to dwell with them. The legend of St. Isa continues. Isa left the worshippers of Jaina and went to Jagannath in the country of Orissa, where lie the mortal remains of Vasha Krishna. Here at Jagannath, the Brahmin priests received him joyfully. They taught him to read and understand the Vedas, to cure with the aid of prayers, to teach and explain the holy scriptures to the people to drive away the evil spirit from the body of man and to restore to him the human form. The soaring steeple of the Jagannath temple dominates the landscape at Puri for miles around. More than 25 generations of pilgrims have come to Puri to worship Jagannath, the Lord of the universe. Jagannath Puri in Urissa. This town houses the ancient temple of Lord Jagannath. Lord Krishna is known as Jagannath here. Puri has been an ancient seat of Vedic culture and studies. This magnificent temple has been in existence hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. Even today, millions of devotees throng the temple which is highly revered in the entire region. The Hemis manuscript discovered by Nicholas Notovich refers to Jesus as Isa. The scrolls reveal that young Isa studied Vedas in this city of Puri. He also learned to cure by aid and prayers and mastered many other spiritual techniques. 
Not only did Isa master the Vedic scriptures, he also started preaching their real meaning to the masses. Initially, the priests of Puri welcomed him, but later they grew jealous and started creating troubles. Isa was compelled to leave Jagannath Puri. Narissa, in the midst of a jungle, are caves where Jain ascetics lived some 2,000 years ago during the time of Jesus Christ. The Brahmin priests and warriors, having learned of the discourse at which Isa had addressed the Sudras, determined upon his death. But Isa, warned of the danger by the Sudras, left by night, reached the mountains, and established himself in the country of the Gautamadis, followers of Buddha, where the great Buddha Shakyamuna was born. He then moved to Rajgriha, the ancient capital of Magadha. Lord Buddha had lived and preached here for a very long time. In those times, India's Magadh Empire was the most advanced and happening place in the world. Magadh had some of the best schools of learning. Young Isa is supposed to have attended some esoteric school in this kingdom. He started becoming familiar with the teachings of Lord Buddha. Having learned perfectly the Pali language, the just Isa devoted himself to the study of the sacred scrolls of the sutras. Six years afterwards, Isa was able to explain perfectly the sacred scrolls. After Rajgriha, Jesus lived in the holy city of Varanasi for a few years. On the banks of Ganga, this city was known as Kashi during those times. Here, Isa studied holy scriptures and other sciences under a guru whose name is said to be Udraka. After some time, he left the city. The Ganges, the river of God, springs from a cave high in the Himalayas. Two miles above sea level, rushing downward to the Bay of Bengal, 1,500 miles away. En route, it passes Benares, the city of a thousand temples. Sunrise of Benares. The devout perform their daily prayers and ablutions on the banks of the Ganges, a ritual that has gone on for thousands of years along the shores of what well may be the world's oldest city. Here in the land where time seems to stand still, pilgrims have cleansed themselves of their sins and sought release from the cycle of rebirth from the beginning of recorded history. Dating back to the days when Benares was known by its ancient name, Varanasi. For centuries, to die in Benares has been the highest blessing to which a devout Hindu could aspire. Death within the confines of this ancient city is said to liberate a soul from the ceaseless cycle of reincarnation. Here at the river's edge, we see the burning ghats where Hindus are cremated, according to their ancient traditions. Little has changed in Benares in the 2,000 years since St. Isa walked along these banks. Northeast, along the Ganges, is the city of Hardwar, where for thousands of years a great spiritual celebration has taken place every 12 years at the time of the full moon between April and May. The Mahakumbha Mela, considered to be the largest religious assemblage on earth, attracts many of the country's great spiritual leaders. It is here, on the banks of the Ganges, that pilgrims come to take part in the bathing rites and to receive the blessings and the teachings of the Swamis gathered along the shores of the sacred waterway known to the Hindus as the River of the Gods. A spectacular event, the last Mahakumbha Mela at Hardwar, took place in 1974.
Just a few miles north of Hardwar, along the Ganges, is the city of Rishikesh, known as the land of the Rishis, or seekers of truth. Rishikesh is the home of many well-known ashrams, or spiritual communities. Best known is the Shivananda Divine Life Society ashram, founded by one of India's greatest yogis, Swami Shivananda. Over the years, his ashram has produced many enlightened disciples, including Swami Sachidananda, Swami Chidananda, and Swami Venkateshananda. Swami Venkateshananda was Swami Shivananda's personal secretary for many years. He fondly recalls what Swami Shivananda had to say about the lost years of Jesus. Swami Shivananda often spoke about Lord Jesus during the Ashram's Christmas celebrations and he knew that Lord Jesus was in India during what are known as the lost years of Jesus. Swamiji often related the lofty moral teachings of Lord Jesus to Buddhism, the teachings of Buddha rather, and statements like, I and my father are one, is a marvelous and magnificent declaration of Lord Jesus. Swamiji related to Vedantic idealism and the miracles of healing and so on that Lord Jesus performed, Swamiji related to high accomplishments as a yogi. And those who witnessed Swami Shivananda's statement concerning Lord Jesus knew that all these came from his own personal experience, personal direct knowledge, not just uh, analysis of the Bible. Perhaps it's good to explain that Banaras was at that time the holy city of Hindu learning, the best of all uh, Hindu scholars lived in Banaras and Rajagriha was a center of Buddhist learning. Close to Banaras is and was the famous Sarnath where Buddha preached his first sermon and both Hinduism and Buddhism were in their heyday during that time, during the time of Lord Jesus. His Holiness Swami Chidananda Maharaj succeeded Swami Shivananda as president of the Divine Life Society in 1963 after the Mahasamadhi or death of his master. A biblical scholar, Swami Chidananda, the son of a prosperous landowner in South India, graduated from India's Loyola College, a predominantly Christian institution, where he was instilled with a lifelong love and devotion for Jesus Christ. Swami Chidananda recalls his master's frequent references to Lord Jesus. When Swami Shivananda said Jesus Christ was a great yogi, when Swami Shivananda said Jesus Christ was a great yogi, he meant that Jesus Christ was an adept in the occult science of Raja Yoga, which is the classical science of meditation. Because he was a master of this science, all the miracles that he performed during his public life were the result of yogic powers that accrue to a master yogi. These powers are called cities, and they comprise powers by which one has control over internal as well as external nature. One has control over the elements, and one has control over life and death as it were. And so, this is how we in India are able to understand the extraordinary miraculous powers which Jesus demonstrated during his life and during his ministry. The miraculous powers of Jesus Christ are natural to one who has reached the highest level of yogic attainment.
More and more evidence reveals that Jesus spent much of his lost years in India. This is more of that story. In the foothills of the Himalayas on the Ganges River, about an hour upriver from Rishikesh, is a cave called Vishishta Guha. Made famous by the ancient sage Vishishta, it has been a home for yogis for centuries, most recently the renowned Swami Purushottamananda. About a five-minute walk down river from this cave is another cave known as the Jesus Cave. Set in the side of a sheer cliff on the banks of the Ganga, the cave has a spectacular view of the river and the surrounding peaks of the Himalayas. The cave derived its name from the tradition that Jesus spent time there during his sojourn in India during the so-called Lost Years. In the last century, both Swami Ramatirtha and Papa Ramdas lived there at separate times and had visions of Jesus meditating there, though they had no prior knowledge of his having lived there. There are still in the caves around Rishikesh many genuine and deeply impressive ascetics who have given up everything to seek God through silence, solitude and meditation. translation of the legend continues. St. Isa spent six years in Jagannath, Rajagriha, Benares, and other holy cities. Everyone loved Isa, for he lived in peace with the Vashas and Sudras, lower castes, to whom he taught the holy scripture. According to Hemis manuscripts, Jesus came to Ladakh after traveling through Nepal, Tibet, and other parts of the Himalayas. He was a great traveler. In fact, some scholars refer to him as the king of travelers. He spent some time in the Buddhist monasteries of the Himalayas and then returned to his homeland. Jesus Christ, as a young man, came to uh, India and he visited various places. He went to Kathmandu. He got influenced with Vedanta and philosophy as well as, as, well as, as, well as with Buddhism. And uh, naturally, he learned from Buddhism non-violence, brotherhood, peace, certain principles of coexistence. And naturally, when he started in min his ministry in Palestine, he taught the same principles which are enshrined in Buddhist canon. Buddhism was in its infancy when St. Esau visited India. It was only beginning to take hold in the East. Although the records of St. Esau's visit were found in Tibet, he did not study Tibetan Buddhism, for it was not until 400 years after his death that Buddhism spread to Tibet. Yet, it was in Tibet where the teachings of Buddhism had been best preserved. The legend continues. St. Isa had sojourned six years among the Buddhists in India, where he found the principle of monotheism still in its purity. At the age of 26, he left India. Isa left India in his 26th year and traveled to Persia, which is now Iran, 
where he stopped at Persepolis, a great spiritual center of the time. Next, he went to Athens, land of the philosopher kings, Homer, Aristotle, and Plato. And finally, to Alexandria, Egypt, where he learned the secrets of the Great Pyramids. In her book, Edgar Cayce on Jesus and His Church, Anne Reed quotes from Cayce's clairvoyant readings. Jesus and John were in Heliopolis, Egypt, for the periods of attaining to the priesthood or the taking of examinations, passing the tests there. According to Cayce, the Great Pyramid of Giza was built to be the hall of the initiates, or that sometimes referred to as the White Brotherhood. In that same pyramid, did the great initiate, the Master Jesus, take those last of the Brotherhood degrees referred to in the Gospel as three days and nights in the tomb? The Master passed his initiation, releasing his soul from bondage to the material world and death. Isa was 29 when he returned to Palestine, where he was to fulfill his destiny. went from city to city, preaching to the poor and proclaiming the kingdom of God. The governor, Pilate, fearing Saint Esau, was inciting the people against the authorities with the intention of becoming king of Israel, had him arrested, imprisoned, tortured, and brought to trial. The judges, having consulted together, said to Pilate, we will not take upon ourselves the great sin of condemning an innocent man and of acquitting robbers which is contrary to our laws. By order of the governor, the soldiers seized Isa and the two robbers and led them to a place of punishment and there nailed them upon crosses which they erected. The earth trembled and the heavens wept because of the great crime just committed in the land of Israel. For they have just finished torturing and executing there the great just Isa in whom dwelt the soul of the universe, who incarnated himself in a simple mortal in order to do good to men. Thus ended the terrestrial life of the reflection of the eternal spirit in the form of a man who endured great suffering for love of mankind. He suddenly appears in Judea at the age of 29. He started preaching and establishing his ministry from there onwards. After a few years, the great Messiah, the Son of God, was crucified in his own country. Well, I had to move fast, and I couldn't with you around my neck. You said you'd send for him, and you did. What did I expect? My hands are sweating. And we haven't even started yet. I'll go along with the shooting until I can think my way out. I even know it was all a picture, whatever it was then. Someday, maybe I'll remember to forget.
us associate crucifixion with death. But many biblical experts feel that Jesus had not died on the cross. There are some strong reasons to believe that. Jesus was nailed only on the hands and the feet. These are not life-threatening injuries. His vital organs were unharmed. It takes quite a long time to die on the cross. But Jesus was taken down within a few hours. When his body was scratched, blood and water came out. This can happen only if the person is alive. Many experts feel that the ointments which were used to treat him are for recuperation. They are not used for funerals. All these factors indicate that there was a plot to save Jesus Christ and he was indeed saved. The Bible says that Christ rose from the dead after three days. Or was he simply healed in three days? I think that the events of the crucifixion was not, it didn't culminate in a resurrection, it culminated in a resuscitation, like a near-death experience, that he survived. The life that he lived after the crucifixion was absolutely phenomenal. He got a lot of things done. Um, he wasn't in hiding, he wasn't a, a miserable barefoot prophet. He was a great leader. He led several exoduses out of Israel. When he was saved from the cross, his uh, concert, Mary Magdalene, flew towards France and he fled away towards Iran, Damascus, and then Tehran and Iran on the same Silk Route. There was in those days the great national highway between Asia and Europe, and the same he traveled again to, on the same route towards this side. He was accompanied by his mother Mary and a group of followers. There are two major Persian books of history. Iqmal Udin of 10th century AD and Razat us Safa of the 15th century. They record that Jesus took the name of Yuza Asaf in Persia and the Turkey region. A Persian dictionary called Farangi Asafia says that Hazrat Isa was known as Yuzu and as he cured lepers, he became known as Yuza Asaf. The healer of lepers. So Yuzu Asaf, healer. So they gave him his name and then from that, uh, from Iran uh, to Kashmir, he is remembered by the same name. When he reached Gandhar, Mother Mary passed away. A tomb can be seen even today. The place of her death is now known as Muri and falls in Pakistan. The Acts of Thomas mentions the arrival of Jesus in the famous city of Takshila. These are the ruins of the famous university which was at Takshila. It was a great center of learning and Buddhist studies. King Gondophorus was the ruler when Jesus had visited Takshila. From Takshila, Jesus reached Kashmir. In 1899, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, an individual who claimed to be the awaited Latter-day Messiah, wrote a book entitled Jesus in India. It detailed Jesus' survival from the cross and the latter part of his life. Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed wrote that Jesus was in a coma on the cross, having suffered a near-death experience. Having survived the crucifixion, he was taken down, unconscious, from the cross after only a few hours, with the help of Joseph of Armithia and Nicodemus, who applied an ointment, a mixture of aloe and mirrors, on his body to heal his wounds, Jesus fully recovered in the tomb. This solidifies the prophetic sign Jesus gave prior to the crucifixion. A wicked and adulterous generation demands a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, 
so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In regards to this prophecy, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed wrote, It is obvious that Jonah did not die in the belly of the whale. All that happened was that he went into a swoon or a coma. The holy books of God bear witness that Jonah, by the grace of God, remained in the belly of the whale alive, came out alive, and his people ultimately accepted him. If then Jesus had died in the belly of the whale, what resemblance could there be between the dead and the living, and vice versa? After leaving his tomb fully conscious and healed from his wounds, Jesus met his disciples who, thinking he was a ghost, were shocked to see him standing before them. He showed them his healed wounds from which they could see nails had been driven through. Around 40 days later, according to Christian beliefs, Jesus ascended to heaven. If Jesus did not die on the cross, though, he was never resurrected, nor did he ascend to heaven. So what happened to Jesus if he survived? According to the Bible, the Hebrew tribes were named after the sons or grandsons of Jacob, whose title was Israel, which means the soldier of God. Isra means soldier and Il means God. So the Hebrew people came to be known as Israelites, the children of Israel. Jacob's first wife, Leah, bore six sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zubalun. Each son was the father of a tribe and received tribal land of their own, except Levi. Levi's descendants, who were priests and temple functionaries, were dispersed amongst other tribes and received no land of their own. Prophets Moses and Aaron were also among the descendants of Levi. Two other tribes, Gad and Asher, were named after sons born to Jacob and Zilpah, Leah's maidservant. Two additional tribes, Dan and Naphtali were named after sons of Jacob born to Bilhah, the maidservant of Rachel, Jacob's second wife. Rachel bore him two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin provided Israel with its first king, Saul, and was later assimilated into the tribe of Judah. While no tribe bore the name of Joseph, two tribes were named after his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. After the exodus from Egypt, ten tribes under the leadership of Joshua took possession of Canaan, the Promised Land. This land was divided amongst the twelve tribes. King Saul governed them for some time, and then was succeeded by King David who established the capital at Jerusalem. King David was followed by his son Solomon, who built the famous temple dedicated to Yahweh, and around 930 BC, the kingdom eventually split into two. Judah and Benjamin occupied the south, while the remaining ten tribes occupied the north and east bank of Jordan. And in history, they eventually became known as the ten lost tribes of Israel. The Bible refers to these tribes as the lost sheep of Israel. The kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel were hostile towards each other. Following the conquest of the northern kingdom 721 BC, it fell under the Assyrians and per Assyrian custom, they began to transport the conquered people, the tribes of Israel, to other parts of the Syrian empire. A century and a half later, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia took over and destroyed the temple and Jerusalem. Then Cyrus captured Babylon and he issued a proclamation which allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem. But only a small number of them went back, and most never returned to their own country. But rather they journeyed further east. The ten tribes were gradually assimilated by other people, and thus disappeared from history. Nevertheless, a belief persisted that one day, these lost tribes would be found. In the time of Jesus, only two of the tribes were in the region where he preached. The second century historian Josephus wrote in his book Antiquities of the Jews that the ten tribes were beyond Euphrates in his time, east of present-day Iraq, 
and in the Persian Empire which extended into India. The mission of Jesus was to reach out to the lost tribes or sheep of Israel, as stated in Matthew 15.24. It was thus imperative for him to migrate to the east. One of the major caravan routes out of Palestine was through Galilee, where Jesus visited his disciples in hiding, to Syria through the Fertile Crescent, and to the east. His first stop was Damascus, and it is evident that it was on the road to Damascus that Jesus confronted Saul of Tarsus, a prominent persecutor of Christians, who later became the Apostle Paul. In the book Jesus in India, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed says that starting his journey from Jerusalem and passing through Nasibas and Iran, Jesus is shown to have reached Afghanistan, where he met the Jews who had settled after their escape from the bonds of Nebuchadnezzar. The mass of evidence showing that the people of Afghanistan, northwest India, particularly Kashmir and neighboring areas are of Israelite ancestry continues to grow. Their physical features, their language, folklore, their customs, their festivals, all attest to their Israelite heritage. Evidence also comes from the names they give to their villages and the monuments and ancient historical works. Following this, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed says that from Afghanistan, Jesus went to Kashmir where some Israelite tribes had also settled. He made this place his home. It is also notable that early church history documents the existence of a gospel in the Hebrew language found in India, which also confirms Israelites settled there. Saint Jerome of around 400 AD wrote that the scholar Pantanus in the second century came across the document in his travels. Saint Jerome further wrote that the Israelites in his time continued to live in the Persian Empire. Some pilot genetic studies on people in India who to this day call themselves Bani Israel or the children of Israel confirm their Middle Eastern origin. There are many correlations about the similarities between Hebrew people and the people of Kashmir. The linguistic similarities which are very strong, types of foods, the types of clothing, the DNA, the kind of knife used by butchers, the shape of the end of the oars of the Shikara boatman is a heart-shaped at the end of the paddle, which is the same as the ancient Hebrew oars. I remember being quite surprised when someone I know was actually hired by the Indian government to do research to try to explain why there are so many Hebrew names in India. First century AD Northern India was a vast center of not only Hinduism, but also Buddhism. The Israelites whom Jesus ministered to in these areas were a minority practicing Judaism. But it is very likely that many adopted the indigenous faiths of Hinduism and Buddhism also. It is possible to trace Jesus' footprints in these lands from some of these ancient texts. And these ancient books of Hindus are called Puranas. One book, Bhavishya Mahapurana, written in Sanskrit, contains an account of a king in India meeting Isa Masiha, Jesus the Messiah, a religious personality of fair complexion, who was a foreigner. Now, here is a document, Bhavishya Mahapurana. This is the most important document. It, it says that Jesus comes to Kashmir. He meets the king Shalivahana about uh, 78 AD. And uh, he tells him that his name is Ishuruputram and Kanya Garbam, born of a virgin. And, and when was this document discovered? It's an ancient manuscript and its date is 117. 117? Yes. So this is literally a, a second century document yes. which says that Jesus yes. was yes. in Kashmir. Yes. Yes. That's, that's very early. That this is early. He means the king of Kashmir. This is the most important document. Can you tell me what Jesus did when he was here? What, what, what happened? You see, the, the first information what we get, that he meets the king. He meets the king. 
and he explains to him how he fled away from the land of Malichas there and how he suffered there and how he came to this place and he stays here. When he stays here, here Persian sources and Arabic sources say that here he changed his name from Jesus to Yuzu. One of the reasons of Christ's arrival in Kashmir can be traced here. This is Kutli Bhag, about 50 kilometers from Srinagar. People are simple, hardworking and efficient in whatever they do. What makes them different is that they are not original Kashmiris. Centuries ago, they came here from Afghanistan's side. They speak the Pashto language, but they have not forgotten that they are originally Jews from Palestine, the homeland of Jesus Christ. They call themselves Bani Israel. History tells us that out of 12 Jewish tribes, 10 had migrated away from Israel since five centuries before Christ. These scattered 10 tribes have been known as the lost sheep of Israel. Many of these lost Jewish tribes have got settled along the Silk Route, Afghanistan and up to Kashmir. There are huge Jewish populations uh, along the Silk Route. Afghanistan, most of the tribes in Afghanistan, the warlords, the Taliban, uh, the, um, the Pashtuns, are all descended from the 12 tribes of Israel. And many are still known by their, their tribal names, their biblical names. And they wandered um, and settled uh, across most of Afghanistan and what is now Pakistan, northern India, and Kashmir. Gathering these lost sheep back in his fold was one of the missions of Christ's life. In the Bible, Jesus says, Go not into the way of Gentiles, and into the city of Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Scholars suggest that the lost sheep of the house of Israel Jesus was referring to included these Jewish tribes which were settled in the regions adjoining Kashmir. These tribes are of a tall, robust frame of body with manly features. The women, fully formed and beautiful, with aquiline noses, and their features also resemble the Jews. Most of the Afghan tribes are the descendants of the Jews. He wanted to seek and save them. The culture and tradition of Kashmiris are different from ours. We have not forsaken our traditions. Their eating habits, costumes and living style is very different from ours. So far, we have not had marital relations with them. Their culture is different. Ours is different. There are several such communities of Bani Israel in Kashmir and India. These people of Jewish descendants have physical features which are strikingly different from other Indian communities. Some genetic studies are also being conducted which indicate the Jewish links. Experts have identified more than 90 tribal or caste names which are common both to Kashmir and Israel. There are a large number of terminologies in Kashmir which might be having Hebrew links. Mr. M. B. Alam lives in his residence at Gutli Bagh. He is a scholar of the history of Bani Israel. We are Israelis connected to Prophet Moses. Prophet Ibrahim had 11 children. Huda was the eldest. We are his descendants. We are Bani Israel. Our living style, food habits, traditions and even language 
is different from that of Kashmiris. With time, the old faith of Christianity was forgotten over generations. Now there are mainly Orthodox Muslims in these areas. However, remnants of the followers of Jesus still exist in the vicinity of Herat, Afghanistan. The British scholar O.M. Burke in his book Among the Dervishes has described these people. Though they are now Muslims, they did not forget their Christian legacy. They have a special attachment to Jesus and refer to him as Yuz Asaf the Kashmiri who came to preach to them. The prophet Yuz Asaf came to Kashmir from the west, the Holy Land, around the first century AD. When Jesus came to Kashmir, Buddhism held complete sway in the region. Together with Buddhism was existing the Vedic culture. So, it is but natural that most ancient records of the arrival of Jesus is found in Pali and Sanskrit documents. The greatest evidence we have from Vishema Puran. Then we have the Chinese, Chinese documents, glass mirror. We have Tibetan, we have Persian manuscripts also. We have manuscripts in Arabic and information in all the things. But the main information, the chief information is from the Sanskrit work, Bhavishya Mahapurana. Bhavishya Mahapurana is an ancient Sanskrit treatise and one of 18 major Puranas. According to some experts like Dr. Fida Hasnain, it was written in the 2nd century AD. This Mahapurana mentions a meeting of Isa Masih with King Shalivahan. Jesus is called Isa Masih in Sanskrit texts. Shalivahan was one of the major kings in Kashmir during the 1st century AD. He had established the rule of the Aryans on this side of the river Sindhu or Indus. The Purana says, One day, King Shalivahan went to the Himalayas. There, in the land of Ladakh, he saw a pious man in the mountains. His skin was fair and he wore white garments. The king asked the holy man who he was. The holy man replied, I am the son of God and am born of an unmarried woman. I have been sent as a prophet to the fallen ones. After the purification of the essence and the impure body and after seeking refuge in the Vedas, man will pray to the eternal. The holy man further said that he has been called Isa Masih. This is a very interesting document indeed. It clearly mentions the name of Isa Masih. It also speaks of him as the son of God and born from an unmarried woman. Glass Mirror is another ancient document mentioning the details of Jesus Christ as Yuza Asaf. The Glass Mirror is the history of religions written in Chinese which was translated into Tibetan. The Glass Mirror puts Yuza Asaf on the same pedestal as that of Buddha. His teachings were similar to that of Buddha. It is believed that when Jesus arrived in Kashmir, he first stayed near Pahalgaon. Jesus was removed from Judea 
as quickly as possible. And as he was again healthy and healed, he moved to India and he lived a long life, 112 years in Kashmir. Some archaeological evidences also support the arrival of Jesus in Kashmir. This ancient Shiva temple was built in 220 BC. According to historian Mullah Naidari, King Gopananda got this temple repaired in the first century. For repairing the temple, Gopananda sought the advice and guidance of Yusa Asa. This fact is supported by other historical documents too. There are four pillars around this temple. There were ancient inscriptions on each of these pillars. Now they have been completely erased. But two inscriptions were photographed in 1869 by Henry Hardy Cole, the then Superintendent of Archaeological Survey of India. During this period, Yusa Asaf proclaimed his prophethood, year 54. He is Yuzu, the prophet of the children of Israel. The mason of this pillar, Razi Hashti Zaku, year 54. This pillar in honor of Eli Kim, son of Marjan. The inscriptions mention Kashmiri year 54. This corresponds to 78 AD. Thus, the probable year of the arrival of Yusa Asif or Jesus Christ in Kashmir is 78 AD. The fourth inscription on the Shiva temple is very intriguing. This pillar in honor of Eli Kim, son of Marjan. But who was Marjan? Story is that Yusasa married Marjan, a shepherdess from the village of shepherds. Now in Kashmiri we say Pohol Gam. Gam means village, Pohol means shepherd. Traverse by boulder strewn Lida River. Pahalgaon is a major center of tourist attraction in Kashmir. Shepherds come from far off lands bringing along their flocks of sheep. People are traditional and rooted very strongly to their culture. According to the Persian history book, Nigaristane Kashmir, Yuza Asif married a shepherdess of Pahagam. It was King Shalivahan who persuaded Yusa Asaf or Isa Masi to marry. The king had shortlisted some girls from whom Isa selected Marja of Pahalgaon to be his wife. According to inscriptions on the Shiva temple, Eli Kim was the name of the son of Marjan and Isa. It seems that there are many aspects of history on which proper research has still not been done. In these serene surroundings is located the famous shrine of Ash Mukam. This monument is known as the burial place and shrine of Baba Sheikh Zainuddin Rishi. He was one of the main saints of Kashmir's famous Rishi order. This entire mosque is constructed over a cave in the mountain. The cave has been used by sages, monks and saints since Vedic times. Kashmir's Rishi order starts from the Vedic sages. It was taken forward by the Buddhist monks and continued by the Muslim saints. It is a unique example of composite culture which is the hallmark of Kashmir. Isa or Jesus 
is supposed to have lived in this cave when he first came to Kashmir. Ancient Rishi Namas or the Chronicles of the Sages indicate towards this fact. This place was earlier known as Ashosh Mukam, which almost means the abode of Isa. In course of time, it got corrupted to Ashmukam. So Ashmukam is basically a place where Jesus has lived, he has meditated, and his that that rod is there. Ashmukam preserves Asai Isa or the rod of Jesus. It is the rod which Isa used to carry with him all the time. The rod is not shown to anybody now. Archaeological investigations lead us to another place called Harwan near Srinagar. Adjacent to Harwan is the ancient archaeological site where the fourth great Buddhist council was held in the first century AD. These walls of small boulders and pebbles have preserved history which unfolded more than 1,900 years ago. It is a saga of that time when great Kanishka was the king of this part of the world. In the first century AD, he convened a great council of Buddhist monks at this very place. Scholars came down from far off places like Central Asia, China, Sri Lanka and other parts of India. This fourth Buddhist council is a landmark event in the history of Buddhism. It gave birth to Mahayana Buddhism. Who was the moving force behind the great revival of Buddhism? Such a great insight requires a great personality. Scholars feel that this great personality was none other than Yuza Asif. The strongest evidence for this are the two coins released by Kanishka. One coin mentions Buddha or Buddha. The second coin mentions Yuzo or Yuza Asif. Kashmiri history books tell us that Yusasaf came from abroad. He was a prophet and a messenger. He came from Israel. He came to spread his teachings. He lived and died here. He is Jesus. He is Isa. The meaning of Yusasaf is the healer. Another meaning is the shepherd, one who teaches others. And our history books confirm that Isa was known as Yusasaf here in Kashmir. Yusasaf continued to teach and preach in Kashmir until he died around the year 80 AD. He was buried in Srinagar. And this, they say, is Yusasaf's tomb. The first building erected around this site was built in 112 AD. In fact, it's now a shared grave site. In the 15th century, the Islamic holy man Syad Nazir Uddin was also buried here. Although both gravestones under the cloth point north-south in the Islamic tradition, the body of Yusasaf is buried beneath in a grave dug east-west in the Jewish tradition. Next to the sarcophagus are two carved footprints. The marks on these are said to be the symbolic representations of the scars of crucifixion. The footprints were carved as a sign. The scars are clearly visible, received when he was nailed to the cross. 
They show that this is the same person who came from Israel and that he lived and died here. You won't find any footprints like these anywhere else in Kashmir. We don't have that tradition. The position of the scars, just behind the toes, do not match each other. But they would align if a single nail was driven through both feet with the left foot placed over the right. Habitant of that tube is Yus Asaf, is the name given to us. Some researchers have said that this name is a translation of Jesus the Gatherer, and they believe Asaf means gatherer, so Jesus the Gatherer. Others have said it means the leader of the healed. We say Jesus, but in India and Pakistan and Kashmir and other parts of the world, he was always either called Isa or Yus Asaf. After having lived there and, and breathed it for so long and and absorbed it in every pore of my body for so long and researched it and seen it from that side of the world for so long. I have no doubt. No doubt is in my heart. That is Jesus in that tomb. The tomb of Yusasaf is hundreds of years older than the beginning of Islam. In the Muslim tradition, an enclosure building is never built around a tomb. But this tomb of Yusasaf has an enclosure building around the sarcophagus, around the grave, and that is an ancient building. One of the significant aspects of the tomb of Yusasaf, there is a carving of two stone feet. The stone feet have strange marks, as though at the time of the burial, the artist was trying to show that that individual had undergone a crucifixion, and to preserve that knowledge in stone. And of course, the Muslim caretakers now keep it covered over with a cloth because they do not want attention to be drawn to that fact. In Kashmir, he preached for a long time and finally left his physical frame at a very old age. And this is supposed to be his tomb. The shrine is beautifully decorated and lighted. The carvings of Kashmiri designs add to the grandeur of the place. The air is filled with fragrance of the divine. The tomb itself is of a pre-Islamic period. This old photograph shows that the wooden coffin was actually covered with a cloth of Jewish appearance. This huge wooden sarcophagus, which we see is only a facade. The real tomb is in the underground chamber, which is sealed now. The tomb lies in east-west direction, which is distinctly the Jewish direction of burial. It cannot be a Muslim tomb, because Muslims bury their dead in southwest direction. We all know that Jesus Christ was a born Jew. In the 18th century, the Grand Mufti of Kashmir was the highest court of law in this land. In 1766 AD, he issued a decree regarding the Rosable Shrine. According to this decree, Yuza Asaf was a prophet to the people of Kashmir. And he had come to Kashmir during the reign of King Gopananda. It is well known that King Gopananda ruled Kashmir during the first century AD. This matches exactly with the time period of Jesus Christ. There is another very tantalizing evidence. These are the footprints of Yuza Asaf. They show deep marks of wounds something like those of crucifixion. Well-known scientist Kurt Berner an ex has examined these marks and says that this is exactly how the feet of Jesus were nailed on the cross, one upon the other, pierced with a single nail.
This board displays an information about the book Tariq e Azam, written in 1729 AD by Kwaza Azam Dead Mari. This spot is famous as the resting place of a messenger. I have read in an ancient book that a prince from a foreign land arrived here and engaged himself in piety and prayers and became messenger of God for the Kashmiri people. What is intriguing is that since always this Yusa Asad is considered to be none other than Jesus Christ himself, the savior of mankind. There is also a possibility of an interesting link between the Jewish culture and Shaivism. This is the Star of David, the most sacred symbol of the Jews. In Vedic culture, this is the symbol of Shiva and Shakti, the conjunction of masculine and feminine forces which gives rise to creation. The Shiva Lingam in Yonipit is a 3D representation of the same symbol. The Shiva temple of the Gopadri hill also houses a Shiva Lingam. The Shiva angle becomes prominent when we find that there is a mention of Isa in the ancient scrolls of the Nath sect of India. It is an extremely old, secretive and mystic sect of Shiva worshippers. Their ancient book, Nath Namavali Sutra, mentions Isa as Isa Nath. It says that Isa Nath finally got settled in Kashmir. The evidences are very strong that Yusa Asif, the prophet buried at Rozabal, and Jesus Christ are the same person. The next step of research should be DNA testing of the tomb. We must use the latest scientific techniques to ascertain the final truth. The DNA is the next important tool that we need uh, to help establish the truth about Rosa Ball too. Whatever may be the ultimate truth, the Rosa Ball Shrine stands as a great heritage, not only of India, but of entire mankind. It must be preserved properly and should be open to all. This shrine, which is revered by Christians, by Hindus, by Muslims, by Jews, it is a national heritage and it, it should be taken over by UNESCO. It should be taken over by Government of India. It should be looked after by the Archaeological Survey of India. I think it is the responsibility of India and the Government of Kashmir to step up to the plate to, um, to take Rosa Ball to protect it and restore it, and to preserve it for all future generations. In the city of Patna, there is the Khuda Baksh Oriental Public Library. It houses a large number of ancient books and documents. There is an old book in Urdu in the library by the name of Kissa Shehzada Yusa Asif Wo Hakim Balahar the story of Prince Yusa Asif and Hakim Balahar. It describes the moment of death of Yusa Asif in Kashmir. Yusa Asif called one of his disciples, Ya Bhod, and instructed him to build a tomb at the very place of his death. Then the great savior delivered his last sermon. Now. At this last moment, my spirit is ready to fly towards the Holy One. It is necessary for all of you to follow the commandments of God. None should go towards the untruth, leaving the truth. In the Valley of Kashmir, the Temple of Solomon, 
contained an ancient stone inscription going back to 54 AD. The inscription said that Yusasaf proclaimed his prophethood and that he was Yusu, prophet of the children of Israel. In modern times, the inscription was destroyed, but not before photographs were taken of it. Darin wacht, wacht means time in Persian. Darin wacht at this time. Yus Asaf, uh, the um, uh, Jesus the Gatherer. Dawai Pagmambari Mikunand, that he proclaimed his prophethood. And the other part, uh, he was Yusu, prophet of children of Israel. Aishan Yusu, Paihambari Bani Israelas. For Catholics in Indian Kashmir, it's all very simple. Jesus was born in Bethlehem and died in Jerusalem. But for the Ahmadi Islamic missionary sect that lives nearby, the truth is very different. They believe Christ is buried here. Although they're Muslims, the Ahmadis believe Christ survived his crucifixion and migrated across Asia in search of the lost tribes of Israel. And they say this is his footprint. What's more, followers of the sect say Jesus lived to be a hundred before being buried in this sarcophagus. For the Ahmadi scholars, it's all very clear. No doubt. It's Jesus' grave? Yes. He died here in Kashmir? Yes, yes, yes. yes. He did not succeed in Jerusalem, so he migrated and reached here. I gave refuge Jesus and his mother Mary on a high place, having meadows, springs. This is Kashmir, above sea level. The Ahmadis continue to worship in the Muslim way, and Catholic priest Father Jim Borst dismisses their belief. My answer is this. If you want to know where Jesus is buried, take the Gospels, the Injil. What do you read there? And there we read that Jesus was buried in Jerusalem, and on the third day he rose again and ascended into heaven. So now I will ask them, whom will you believe? The Injil, the Gospels, or Ghulam Ahmad Mirza? who a hundred years ago popularized the story that Jesus was buried here in Kashmir. Do you believe yes. Jesus is buried here? Yes, yes. I have seen from my eyes with my eyes that, that coffin or that um, grave too. You believe it's the tomb of Jesus Christ? Yes, yes. تیما یور تیم ساد شتیم بون فرم مو یچ یوان بوئی پیغمبری یچ بوئی پیغمبری یوان پنس خلیفہ حضرت بابا داؤد خاکر رحمت اللہ علیہ 
پس یہ اور کھمت ام نال نال کھمت یت نال مچ وری بن کن اچ کرمت ام خیال یم نال منز تو یور ہرس نی وان کیل یہ سائیڈ اس یوان ام پت یوان یہ جائے مقدم صاحب یہ جائے یوان تو یہ چھ اسان ام ساتن خلیف جد ماجین نوروز صاحب تو تم چھ مس ہوت یوان تم چھ ہاوان ام اسان یہ جائے of Jesus. Did any of them venture to India after the death of their master? We need look no further than to St. Thomas, who was one of the chosen twelve, known as Doubting Thomas, because he demanded tangible proof before believing in Christ's resurrection. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, St. Thomas is said to have evangelized the lands between the Caspian Sea and the Persian Gulf, even venturing further east into India. According to the apocryphal Acts of Thomas, St. Thomas entered India as a carpenter, preached the gospel, performed many miracles, and died a martyr's death. Today, there is an active Christian community along the Malabar coast in South India near the city of Madras. This church is named after the apostolic founder, St. Thomas, who 2,000 years ago lived and preached the gospel in India. Father A.J. Adekalam, Vicar General of the Archdiocese of Madras Mailapur in South India, speaks about St. Thomas and his church. This cathedral actually was only built in 1886. Formerly there was a smaller church. Still earlier there was only the tomb here. This cathedral actually stands over his tomb. And uh, right from the early century, somehow this tomb had been kept in veneration by the people of the soil. Historicity of it is established right from the uh, early days, say the first, second century, for example, here. We have the tomb of the apostle. It uh, was opened in the year 222. And so um, we have like that uh, right from the early days, uh, historicity mm. connected with this uh, place. According to tradition, he arrived in India in the year 52 AD and the place of his activity was in Mailapur because this place is a place uh, rich in uh, Hindu culture and heritage. So he used to come here and live and preach and he used to go up to the mountain which is called by his name St. Thomas Mount today where he used to spend nights in prayer, as his master did. It is uh, in one such time that he was supposed to have been killed there. Jesus Christ, when he had uh, revealed himself as the Son of God, 
no more thinking of God as something far away being, but closely connected as a son to the Father. That is the greatest revelation man had ever. In the life of Jesus, between the 12th year and the 30th year, perhaps he might have come this side. They have no historic proof to say that Jesus ever came to India, lived in the Himalayas. They have some reasons to connect like that. There are no historical evidences for that. When Thomas stepped ashore, he was not to know that he would spend the next 20 years here preaching the gospel. According to the Acts, as he entered the city, he heard the sound of pipes and organs and much singing. For there were once docks and quaysides on this site, warehouses and the palaces of rich merchants. Here too was a synagogue for the Jews and a temple of Augustus for the expatriate Roman community. It was here, perhaps on the site of these crumbling walls, that St. Thomas, is supposed to have erected the first church in India. It's frankly amazing how little is left of Cranganore now. A few old walls and towers, the laterite eroded to the texture of old peach stone and choked with vines and creepers. But 2,000 years ago, this is one of the biggest ports in the entire world. All the spices of Malabar were brought here, oils from the Himalayas, slave girls from northern India, a lot of the silk trade from Central Asia. And out here, 300 triremes from the Red Sea to buy it. But now, all that's left, just a few old walls. At first, I could see little evidence that this was the place of his arrival, apart from the St. Thomas canteen and cool bar. But close by, there was a small fishing village. The fishermen are mostly Christian, and I met with two, called rather unexpectedly, Peter and Thomas. Thomas. My name's Thomas. Uh, I'm Peter, and I work as a fisherman on the high seas. St. Thomas was a disciple of Jesus Christ. He came and preached the teaching of Jesus to the local Hindus. When you read in the Gospels about Peter and James being fishermen on the Sea of Galilee, does it all sound very familiar? <laughs> of course it's familiar. And we feel that connection. We feel the connection all the way from Peter. We're proud to be fishermen, and we believe in that connection. It is with that faith that we go out to sea. When the sea gets rough, it's God's name we call. The sea is very unpredictable. You never know whether you'll come back to shore. We pray to God, of course, and to Jesus Christ. We pray to the saints, too. In a storm, to be honest, you don't really have time to think, you just call on everyone. But Christ is the real power. Everyone else is secondary to him, even St. Thomas. They were, after all, his disciples. When we're in need, we pray first to Jesus and only then to St. Thomas. Christ's apostles underwent great hardship to take his word to people right around the world. Here in Kerala, St. Thomas taught people the word of God. At the end of my journey, I climbed to the top of the hill outside Madras, still known as St. Thomas's Mount. This ancient chapel was built on the site of an even older monastery, marking the place of the saint's martyrdom and visited by Marco Polo. It's a quiet and peaceful place, sanctified by the prayers of generations of pilgrims. its very smallness, as well as its incredible antiquity, this chapel is an oddly appropriate memorial to St. Thomas. For while Christianity has never been a major faith in India, it is a religion with incredibly deep roots in the soil, and one which has clung on with remarkable tenacity, despite the odds. Above all, the church here has remained faithful to the tradition of St. Thomas's incredible journey from Palestine to southern India a story long forgotten in a West which has come to regard itself as the home of Christianity, forgetting that Christianity is in its essence not a Western, but an Eastern religion. Sitting in the tiny chapel, it seemed a long way from the start of my journey, in the deserts of the Holy Land. 
where St. Thomas had grown up and where I had stumbled on his story in the pages of the Acts. I couldn't help thinking that for a man who was famous for having been a doubter, it showed a quite extraordinary leap of faith to have travelled quite so far with the seeds of a new religion, and finally, to have given up his life for his beliefs. What's the matter with the time I keep it round circles around me all day? Why can't I complete a task and feel good at the end of the day? Why don't you turn the TV? 